Good morning, everybody. Before I get started with this lecture on the publication process, I'd like to remind you of our sponsor here. This is uh, sponsored by Sunshine Pills, where every day is a bluebird day, Sunshine Pills. Sunshine Pills are produced by Happy Barra Pharmaceuticals. So thank you for watching this video. And also I'd like you to make to encourage you to subscribe, click the button in the bottom right hand corner. You know, it takes time for me to produce all these videos and subscribing increases the likelihood that I will get paid through the through the advertisers. And we don't get paid unless we hit a certain threshold of of subscribers. I'm shooting for a thousand now. That's my first goal before I get to the hundred thousand that I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, I mean, that's how much interest people have in statistics. But if you like skiing, you know, there's always good skiing videos. All right. So let's get on with today's today's lecture. This should be fun. Yeah, because people are aiming to publish their research. I mean, who doesn't like seeing their name in lights, right? Sort of metaphorically speaking, lights. You go to the Google Scholar. Don't you want to put in your name and see the publications that you had? It's exciting. Certainly, especially your first publication ever. That's the most exciting thing. Even if you're the second, third, fourth, 29th author, whatever. It depends on what field you're in. Authorship placement is really critical. And first author means that you generally are the one that came up with the the idea last author in some fields, like in medicine, means that you're the senior author. So there's placement is important, but first of all, we got to get there, right? So today I'm going to talk about what the process is to getting published. Well, first thing you got to do is you got to find a home for your manuscript. So in the last lecture, I talked about writing the manuscript, but now it's written, ready to go. Generally, when I write the manuscript. Very actually before I start writing the manuscript, I try to find a home for the journal. That's an expression we use, a home for the journal. And because the, the home will dictate the writing style. Each journal has its own quirks, right? And what, what it wants to see. So you, you want to make sure you get to know that stuff. But so I'll get to that anyway. So I'd, I'd like to know in advance when I choose a journal, what I'm looking for is it's standing in the field. Now, sometimes if you're in a field where, where, where there, it's not very popular, like you're studying something that's very obscure, maybe obscure diseases, for instance, you're not going to get a great deal of readership. And that's going to mean that your, your journal probably will not have a high impact factor. So we use impact factors as a way to shop for journal. So an impact factor is a quotient and it's the citations in a given year plus the next year. So for instance, if we're looking at impact factors, ones that I found most recent here for 2022, maybe you know, 2023 could be out soon, but 2022, so I'd get, the site the number of citations in for that journal in 2021 plus or it's 20 2019 or 20, 2020 sorry and then 2021 and divided by the articles published in 2020 and 2021 and that will give me the impact factor Higher impact factors are considered better, but again, it depends on what what your field is. So, articles that have that are um have very very high impact journals that have very high impact factors tend to be those journals that have a higher readership. Something like something like um oh let me think uh um Mer the New England Journal of Medicine. More people would read that say than than a journal on on cigarette smoking because it's just more popular, right? You'll get, or nature tends to be the high, one of the highest impact factor journals because it has a broader readership. So you're, you're tending to get more citations from those journals. Well, some of the drawbacks to using this, this approach and looking for impact factors is that 
that impact factors are not freely available, like lists of them in general. They're not, but because of the advocacy people do these days, they're, you tend to be able to find everything for free. So you might have to do a little extra search. Um, so otherwise it's those that subscribe, subscribe and are indexed by this web of science database are, are used for the calculating of impact factors. So not every single journal will have an impact factor and you won't have access to all those, those impact factors anyway. But, um, the, the main journals that you should be submitting to have impact factors. And, and these days it's, I'm seeing a proliferation of journals, especially journals that are are open access. Well, I'll get to that in a second. And open access means that you have access to them. You don't have to pay for access. But I'm seeing more and more journals and it takes time for these journals to get, get impact factors. So you don't just get one right away. So it takes a little time. Obviously it takes a couple of years to, as I showed you this calculation, you have to have a couple of years of data in order to have an impact factor. But I'll show you a listing of journals that have impact factors that goes into the thousands, right? So, so there's plenty to choose from there. So here's some, here's a link where you could look at the 2022 impact factors. Again, you can find stuff freely available if you look hard enough. So I was looking at this listing here at the, that link, and I'm going to just show you how many how many there are. So it goes up to 9,485 or 84, 9,483, oh, 9, right? The slowest journal is point, uh, impact factor is point 0.1. I mean, we'd have to go up pretty high. I'd say in my, my experience, most journals that we submit manuscripts to are somewhere between one and you know five. Then, you know, you can get higher and higher and higher. You can see that there's quite a, quite a few thousands that are in the one range, right? They go on and on. Then you get higher and higher and higher. Journals and more, like here, Journal of Microbiological Methods. That's an impact factor of 2.2. .2. So that's higher than, say, some of the other ones that we saw in the bottom there, but uh, Journal of School Health. But they're obviously not that popular among researchers. But if we get up to... To the threes, we start seeing things like sexually transmitted infections, uh, pediatric research. It's a little bit, a little bit more popular. Perhaps more established journals as well. International Journal of Cell Biology. So you're getting the fours and fives. So you're getting some good, good impact factors. I think most people would be happy if they were in the four or five region. Dental materials, earthquake spectra. There's a lot of different journals out there. How do you pick and choose, right? Journal of Saudi Chemical Society 5.6. So these are like what I consider the more normal levels, but now, now let's go to the winners here. So let's drum roll and see what the, the highest impact factors are. Wow, look at those. Cancer Journal, CAA, Cancer Journal for Clinicians. That's the highest in Lancet. Some of you may be familiar. I wasn't... It, familiar with this journal. I haven't had to read it, but Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Nature, Nature. So medical journals, right? Nature Review Materials, Natural Medicine. So it seems like they're pretty much all medical journals. It's psychology. Anything in psychology? Let's see. Do you see anything in psychology here? I think there's a couple in psychology tend to get good good um you think psychology would be more popular but i guess medicine's more more popular lancet planetary health 25 uh, psychotherapy and and psychosomatics 22.8 so that's a really good impact factor so you can see that there's a lot of a lot of good journals with high impact factors, but it tends to be more in medicine. So what should you do? What should the rule be when trying to identify a journal? I say go high, right? Aim high, aim high. 
hope for the best, <laughs> always accept, ex expect the worst, hope for the best, right? So aim high. So try, try to submit to the highest ranked journal that you're eligible to. You're not going to be eligible for every journal. Like if I'm doing something on 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 psychology, I'm not going to submit it to a mechanical engineering journal, right? You're going to submit it to the appropriate journal. Do that. If you, you're accepted, celebrate. If you're rejected, go to the next highest impact factor journal. That's the way we work. So, I mean, this could be a long and slow process. Long and slow process. Yes. Let's talk about, I mentioned open access journal. So there's a difference between open access and subscription only journals. Well, open access journals are freely available to readers. So for instance, uh, I, I see a lot of open access journals, like the one journal that I published in recently, Stats, S-T-A-T-S, Stats, it's open access. So anybody can read it. And that's really good for the, for the author. It's really, really good because people can read your articles and that's what we want i mean don't we do work so people can read it and use it and cite it subscription access journals require that institutions have subscriptions and those subscriptions are extremely expensive so because they're so expensive usually libraries prioritize subscriptions that match the needs of their students right so in a university like LaSalle, where we don't have medicine or but we do have nursing. We're gonna have probably more nursing related journals than, than just general medical journals, but we'll have psychology journals because we have good psychology programs and so on, right? With subscription journals, the authors do not own the copyright. So you can't, you don't earn any money. For, you don't earn any money from any of these anyway. So if you're thinking that you're gonna earn a living Earn a living by earn a living by writing articles. That's not the way it works. I mean, it helps in terms of career placement and pushing science forward, but certainly it's not going to help you and in, in terms of your income or anything like that. But you certainly don't own the copyright for subscription journals. When you publish in an open access journal, you do own the copyright, but. The problem is, of course, is you have to pay to publish in these open access journals. So you're paying for the copyright. That's It's an interesting model. It's a model that is advocated by proponents of, of open access, right? Is, is that we'll pay for, we'll pay for our, the publication process so long as that everybody has access to our material and we own the copyright. So that's great, right? So that's what we're we're looking for in these open access journals. But it's important to note that this isn't pay for play. So you're not paying to get published. You're paying for the processing fees. Everything else is exactly the same in an open access versus versus a subscription journal. The whole peer review process, everything is the same. So you're not getting any advantage by paying for it. So if you think that, then you're you know you're wrong. However, I, I could also add that if you have a good standing in the research community, sometimes those fees can be waived. Like I had both of my my last two publications that were in open access journals, I had their fees waived for a number of reasons. One was you know, a good researcher, and they they knew it already. And especially these newer journals, they want you know good researchers. It's kind of good advertisement for them. Right. And then once you're in, and if, if, if your article gets good play on that journal, you could probably also negotiate either a lower fee or getting the fee waived. There's always a way to reduce that fee. So don't let that be a deterrent to publishing in an open access journal. So, so it's, now let's say we selected the journal we need to know what type of articles are allowed. Again, we when we write them, our, our man, we have manuscripts, right? We have manuscripts that we're submitting for review, but our manuscripts have to match whatever whatever the the allowable styles are from that journal. So, what type of articles are allowed? Would we uh, original articles, brief reports, review articles, opinions, book reviews? These are all different options that I've seen. Original articles are generally, those are 
Those are statistically driven articles, right? Sometimes they can be review articles too, but review articles generally its own category. Review article is just same kind of thing you've written in all your courses before a literature review. Original articles are data driven articles. Brief reports, I love brief reports. Brief reports are shorter original articles. Generally, you pick a brief report if you're not reporting something that requires a great deal of explanation. But I like these from an act from a professor standpoint. See, in, in our field, we have to publish. Right? That's that's kind of our part of our, our gig, right? We have to keep on publishing. And publication have equal weight, whether they're brief reports, original articles, believe it or not, or books in general. A whole book can have the same weight as a brief report. Brief reports are brief, they're shorter. So say if you have, if you have like 20 or 40 pages, say for an original article, you may you know have to do this in like 10 pages total with everything, including figures and references. So I, I like brief reports. Generally, I don't want to write that much unless I'm writing a book. So so that, that's a really good option. And if it counts equal to everything else, why not do it? But because it's peer reviewed for people who are in the academic realm, a track, track, academic track, you need you need publications, you need publications to peer review journals. So that those count for a lot. Also, you can see book reviews. It'd be nice if somebody would review my book in one of the journals. That'd be great. Know the journal's formatting style and other production criteria, like what's the maximum length of a of a manuscript. Sometimes that maximum length is given in terms of word count. Sometimes it's given in terms of page limit. So you should be used to this from being in school. You always get pages. Usually people tell you it has to be a minimum of this many pages. In the academic world, it's usually it's a maximum because people tend to want to write a lot. Word counts are, are nice and easy to navigate too because you always see them in your word processor. You're given some restrictions on how many tables and figures you can have, including the formatting, right? Uh, and the types of figure files accepted. Honestly, when I get to the point where I'm asked about this, this is where I'm, I'm really uh, bored because I love the writing. I love doing the research, but I hate this stuff. Like, okay, well, you're, you have to have this many pixels. I'm like, oh my gosh. At this point, I might just want to some finalize so I can just move forward. But that happens so often. They're always getting, can you change this to such and such pixels? And I'm like, oh God, okay. Some journal journals cap how many references you're allowed. So you have to be very good, parsimonious at at at, at adding your references. When people start learning to write, they tend I, I mentioned previously they tend to write in this very formulaic fashion where they talk about one article at a time and then as they advance they learn how to integrate ideas into into um, sentences paragraphs and they, they do all these citations but what sometimes people go overboard and start citing everybody because they're so afraid of getting caught for plagiarism but then so then the journals especially if you're, if you're using a style like APA style it's very cumbersome but no wait a minute we can't have that many cite so reduce it. So it's kind of a funny interplay between I'm doing too little and I'm doing too much. Not going to find a just right balance, right? Uploading your manuscript. Again, now everything's done online. There's no more time sending anything in. What a world it was when we had to send things in and wait forever for snail mail to get things to, to the publisher. Not anymore. You have to create account, complete all permissions, Generally, you're asked for all authors to complete conflict of interest statements and how much they contributed. So this is all very, very important. Conflict of interest, there's a lot of conflicts of interest. Like if I do a stu study, like for instance, the study I'm doing on smoking, working with the Quit Sure app, I'd have to make sure that they know that I'm being paid by that if I, if I was submitting something uh, for publication, right? Because that could be a major conflict of interest. If so, I'm writing an article, I'm being paid for them by them. How do how does the reviewer know that I'm not going to you know, fudge the data because I'm working for somebody? So you have to have a conflict of interest 
statement there and then also how much contributions you made there's a tendency for people to want to just have their names in publications because it helps with their academic standing as i mentioned but to ensure that people aren't just putting piling names on a list one has to be screened for contribution it's not enough to review the paper for grammatical errors that's not considered contribution there has to be a substantial contribution like doing the statistical analysis or doing the literature review. So there has to be much more to it than just a little, a little, a little work. We have to submit cover letters, just like you're applying for a job, you have to submit a cover letter to the editor and in the cover letter, you should make sure you include all this, all the required content that's, that's, listed in the journal's portal some for example in, include that the well probably this is the most common one the manuscript is not under review with any other journal at the time which kind of sucks because you should you think you know i want to shop you know i'm going to submit to three different journals and one of them is going to take it well you're not supposed to do that you're supposed to submit one at a time and i've never submitted to more than one at a time i, I stick with that the work is original basically you're not copying somebody else's work and the authors have no conflict of interest you state all that in the letter right so that's just, that's very typical and also you want to make sure that your journal fits the manuscript's mission because if it doesn't they'll probably so as an associate editor i screen all these articles when they're submitted when i do accept something for you know, to work on. I try not to accept too much because I end up getting too busy and I, I can't fulfill my duties correctly as an associate editor. So I try not to do too much. But we, when we get manuscripts, we have to look at them and see if they fit what we're doing. And if they do, then we let pass them on to our peer reviewers. So you should mention how in your cover letter, how your manuscript fits in with the mission of the journal. Let's talk about the peer review process. This is probably the most, most difficult process of all. When we submit a journal or a manuscript to a journal, we're so excited. Oh, it's been submitted. It's the same when you're submitting a grant. If you're writing a grant, it's that it's a, it's a worthy of celebration because you've done a lot of work. It's as long as you actually did a lot of work and submitted and you just didn't throw something in. But even if you you this is your first time ever doing it, it's still an accomplishment. So what happens next is we, the associate editors or the editors will look over the, the manuscript to see if it fits, that's number one. And then we seek reviewers. And this is not an easy process. In general, we, we need two or three reviewers. It depends on the, on the journal. So the one I'm working with, Frontiers, Psychology of Nutrition, we, um, require two peer reviewers at minimum. Sometimes you need three, sometimes you want a statistical reviewer, an expert statistical reviewer, but it's not easy finding this because, because peer reviewers aren't paid for doing the peer reviews. And generally you're, you're, you're bombarded with requests for peer reviews. So you have to say no to most, like I say no to almost everyone right now that submits request for a peer review to me. I just I just really don't want to do them because I have too much other stuff I need to accomplish. And and they take a lot of time and you want to do a good job when you do these. However, people who are new to the field, it's an honor to be a peer reviewer. I know many people who never get requests for peer reviews and they beg that I send them one. Okay, sure. For them, it's a big deal. If you're new in your career, you want more of those. So you can build up a resume and put it put it on your CV. That's the, the researcher's curriculum vitae, the uh, researchers CV, I mean, a uh, resume. So you, you want to put it on there that you're a peer reviewer for such and such, and such general, journal, but generally we try not to do too many of them. So it's, it's hard just to find them. I, I spent a lot of time submitting requests for reviews because I, I, I want the best people to review something and those people are the busiest one. So if, well, once we do secure the number of reviewers. The re reviewer does the following. The re reviewer reads over the manuscript and has to provide the following. They start with an uncritical synthesis of the manuscript. Just like 
this manuscript is a review of this theory uh, and how it applies to blah, blah, blah. It just shows that you read it. And then the reviewer writes general comments like, overall, the manuscript was very well written or overall, the manuscript was poorly written. Uh, overall, the statistical methods look good or the statistical methods are not so good, you know, that's stuff like that. And then they write specific comments like on line one, page 10, the writer did such and such when it should have been such and such. Or is there a reference online? But, you know, just stuff like that. That's very, very specific. And these can, these, uh, <laughs> these can be very long. I remember I did a, a review and for some reason I just went over everything and this author wrote back, you know, this reviewer who was, I, mean, I think he was annoyed that I, when I did that or he or she was annoyed that I did that. And sometimes, hey, it happened. It depends on, you know, you people like myself, I'm very detail oriented. So when I look at something, I just probably I was grading papers at the time and I got this review and went in a lot of detail. So in, in terms of the outcome of the process, once the peer review is done, you have some, some options here, and not for you. I mean, there's some options for the reviewers and the editor. There's an outright rejection. That means you're just rejected. You get a lot of those in, in anything that you do in life. There's a lot of rejections. Uh, you can get a revise, or re revise and resubmit with either small revisions or major revisions. Those are, that's probably the more, more it's probably the best possible. It's like the average, not even the average, but the the average good outcome is that you get a revise and resubmit. And then you'll get a detail of things that you have to do to resubmit. And then there's outright acceptance, which is very rare. I did note, I think in a, in a prior lecture that I did get, one that was an outright acceptance. With, I, basically, there was no no revisions, but that happens sometimes. Under the correct circumstances, that can happen. The author has to decide on the next step. So we're going to assume revise and resubmit. You make the changes. You write a response showing what has been done to make the manuscript better. You have to, again, submit a letter. And in the letter, one has to explain what changes were made in response to the reviewer's comments. Now, this is mostly done online now. So for instance, with uh, the journal I'm working with, everything's done online. And there's you can have a back and forth between each reviewer and the, the writer, which is new. I mean, before we, we had that, but it was time consuming. So I'd have to do it, submit it, and then then somebody would have to read it and get back to me. But now it can be done online very quickly, almost instantaneously. Like you could write a response. And if I'm online, I can respond right away. So you, there's, not, there's, not, there's not so much wait. Although I'll admit sometimes, even for myself, it takes time because I got so many other things going on, even if it can be instantaneous. When authors respond to the reviewers, they have to respond to each comment by the reviewer, every single comment by the reviewer. So if you have a reviewer who does detailed, a detailed analysis of your work, you need to make comments about those. Like say there's one comment about a spelling error on page 10, line 14, you have to respond to that. Now, if there's a plethora of these or a cornucopia full of of such comments, then you could say, maybe make a more general statement, like editing was done. We went through all lines in which you, the reviewer, reviewer two or reviewer three identified these errors and then you just say you, you changed them. But you really need to go line by line and explain what's been done. And then you, what you want to do is you, when you resubmit the manuscript, somehow you have to show where this was done. So some people put put lines uh, around the borders of the text where changes were made, or you can do other things as well. You want to make it really neat. I wouldn't use something like track change because that, that can be really messy. But there has to be a way that you can show to the to the editor that the changes were made. If 
you get major major revisions then that, that's you have to think should i resubmit it there uh, i don't know what, what you could do is well there's a few options one of them is to find another journal another option is to just i'm not one who likes to quit anything but there are times when there are fatal flaws and these flaws make it impossible to to make the changes and if that's if that's if that happens then sometimes you have to get let go of a bad project as i say i've done that before and i, I really don't like doing that my goal when I write something is for it to get published. But sometimes it's not worth it, right? Sometimes things will happen. So let's, so we did a assuming revise and resubmit. Let's assume rejection. So I would say the same thing with the last comment. We want to review the comments carefully. And then we can either submit them elsewhere. If, if some, sometimes you're rejected because of, journal has a very high standard for accepting manuscripts and they only can accept so many and they get a ton of people submitting. It's like when you apply to undergrads some people apply to these highly competitive colleges and very few get accepted. It doesn't mean you're a bad student. It's just there were some that were whatever met the criteria better. So if you have a really good review, but it's rejected, just submit it somewhere else. Make make the changes that you you found in the last peer review and you'll get you'll have a much better likelihood of being published in another journal right so that that's what you can do of course you can also as i said you can quit the project if the project has fatal flaws in it and then that's again a last last resort because like i note here most researchers don't stop until a manuscript is published and again it's generally not in my dna to quit but again, if you get something that has a fatal flaw and you can't do anything about it, sometimes you have to let go. Assuming you get accepted, then you'll receive page proofs. And then you have to go over those proofs and answer any queries. Those are questions from, from the, 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 whatever, the, I don't know what you call those, typesetters or people who are actually formatting the, the, the manuscript Look, look at if there are any formatting issues or there's some other issues that they want you to look at, like maybe the changing the quality of the picture or something like that. I, I don't really like this part because I'm interested in the writing. I'm not interested in this part, but in, whether it's a manuscript or a book that I've written, there's always going to be these the, this reviewing of the page proofs. I'll, I'll give you an example. I wrote this book that had, I don't know how many thousands of words. There was some limit, 70,000 words, I think. That's hitting me right now. I may, I may be wrong. But I had to do page proofs like five times. So basically, I read the book five times over and over again to answer every little thing to make sure they didn't change anything weird. Because sometimes people change things in your manuscript and that change could be very, very small but essential and you don't want it. So you have to read through this. So it's a very time-consuming process. But the good news is now you can list your manuscript as in press so it's in press i love that uh bu -bu 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 -bu. that's it yeah so depends on the journal going from in press to actually being published depends on the journal depends on what what they offer what options they offer some journals give you um, online only until it's actually physically published i like having a copy a physical copy because it's something you can keep right in your library that's really nice but eventually it'll get published but so i hope this doesn't dissuade anybody from from wanting to get published you should always want to be published right and that that should be your goal you should want to get get published and you should go through the pains in order to to um to achieve your goal and by the way if you have pains just take sunshine pills remember every day is a bluebird day sunshine pills everybody have a wonderful day and thank you